Okay, team takeover in the building. Thank y'all for allowing me to have Keith on tonight and sharing him with me for, for a little while. Appreciate it. Respect everything you guys are doing in the AAU world. Keep it up, please. I am Chani. Thanks for joining. DK, what up, baby? Jonathan K33, what's going on? <laughs> All right. I just talked to him a little bit ago. He said he was coming, so we're good. Dees, what up, man? Carlos and Teresa, what's going on? They gave my nephew, JG. JG, man, we're gonna get this schedule together. You on next week, man. Let's get it, let's get it together, man. I need you, dog. G unit, what up? What up, Ralph? Do so 903, ball at 315. Welcome. Appreciate you joining in. The man of the hour has arrived. Welcome to the Positive Impact Podcast. Tonight's guest is somebody who I've seen coach a few times and liked his style. Um, liked the way that he runs his program. And I'm honored to have him on tonight. Coach of the Year, Nike EYBO, and one of the best AAU coaches out there. I'd like to welcome the president of Team Takeover, Mr. Keith Stevens. What's up, man? How are you? What's going on? Man. I'm like, man, just staying out the way. You know how this go right now. Absolutely. How your family doing, first of all? Everybody's good. Everybody's good. good and, um, healthy, so, you know. Good. Kind of point. So, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, you know, you might not know you might not know each other personally, but basketball brings people together. Um, I've been to Peach Dam a few times. I've seen your teams play. Um, I've always liked your fiery style, your no-nonsense approach, and, you know, 
you seem like the type of coach that will go to bat for his kids and this program. And I, I respect you for that, first and foremost. No, I appreciate it, man. Like, it's that's what it's about. If you're going to do this, you got to do it for the kids. And that got to be the number one passion, man. But, you know, we of course, we never met face-to-face. -face, but like I said, you, you've you come well recommended, you know, by, right, by good. good friends of mine, man. And, like, yeah. I, I'm just glad you wanted to have an opportunity for us to sit down and talk. And, and I'm an open book, you know. It's nothing I'm not willing to talk about. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So um, give me a little bit of background, man. I know you're from the DMV area. Um, you know, do you have a basketball? What's your basketball background? Have you played and, and how you got into coaching? So, man, I, I played. I played at Forestville High School. We were two-time state champs, um, played junior college basketball. Uh, when I got custody of my son at night, I think I was 19, mm. I, uh, I stopped playing, mm. you know, you know, actively, and I came and I got custody of him, and I, I got into coaching at that point. So, mm -hmm. shit, man, it's been, you know, almost 27 years now. So just, you know, it's been a blessing to still be able to be impactful, even without playing the game, but more so being able to teach it and help kids accomplish some of the goals that I wasn't able to accomplish or achieve for, you know, getting a free education and things like that. So that's what it's about. Absolutely, absolutely. And so you did some, you did some coaching. You were involved with DC Assault. DC Man, I, did Blue Devils. I did a little bit of everything. I started out coaching high school basketball. Um, school way back mm -hmm. Lord Baptist with uh, Lewis Bullock. Then I went on to okay. uh, the New Newport School with uh, Damar Johnson, Rodney White, uh, Jameson Brewer, James White, and guys like that. From mm -hmm. there, I started working actually in the sports agency business with a company based out of D.C. when we was representing uh, Chris Wilcox, Steve Francis, Juan Dixon, them, and then the AU thing came on humble. You know, I had, I had flirted with it before with, with D.C. Assault and a little bit with the Blue Devils, but it came on a humble, humble of a good friend of mine was running a program, mm -hmm. and he asked me would I come over and help him recruit a certain kid, a kid by the name of Chris Braswell. And when I recruited that kid, helped him recruit him, the mom thing was, you know, hey, I'll let, I'm willing to let him play, but I need to know that you're going to stay and coach if, I play, if he plays. And that's kind of how I got back into AU things. Like, at, at that point, before that, I wasn't really – you know, into it, I was more so just doing other stuff, training and, you know, recruiting guys for a sports agency. Okay. Nah, that's what's up. That's what's up. So what year did Team Takeover start? What year did you establish Team Takeover? We started Takeover in 2009. In 2009. Um, we were, yeah, we were actually, I partnered with a good friend of mine, uh, Artie Jones, who, where he rest in peace, that passed away. And mm -hmm. I got an opportunity, came my way in 2008, 2009, when Nike came to me and they they felt like they wasn't as um, established in the areas they would like to be, you know, and as down, I know I don't say established, but dominant. Right. And um, they seen what we were doing without a contract mm -hmm. and uh, just asking what we'd be interested in coming over. And we kind of just, we went that way and kind of built it from there. Okay. So team takeover, explain the culture. You're the, you're the face of, you're the face of team takeover. What's, what's the culture of, of team of team takeover like what what are you guys about i mean i think it's the biggest thing is just good family and good kids you know and hard work like we want like i don't want anyone a part of this that wants want something handed to them like we want guys and families that want to grind for it and they want to earn it and they want to and they want to do things in, a, in an ethical way um you know and want to be held accountable because i mean you and i both know that's the biggest thing nowadays is a lot of people want they want the glory but they don't want what comes with it and they don't want to be held accountable and on that on that path to get into it you know what i mean mm -hmm. one thing you can't do and i won't do is like you can't sacrifice yourself for a good player right. you know what i mean or or just for a win you gotta you gotta be willing to you know to to take a bump to hit a bump in the road in order to be successful and i always tell mm -hmm. i got a saying i always say there's no such thing as success without sacrifice right. you know so if you're not willing to sacrifice something for your teammates it's not the place for you Absolutely, absolutely. So I talk to my guy Terrell Myers all the time. We are one um, about the new school kid as opposed to when we came up. How do you right. guys? How do you guys like? You know, because it would be tough for me, honestly, to to balance how I grew up to how these kids are coming up in the age of social media and everything. So how do you keep the kids grounded? How do you keep the kids from making it about the team and not about them, especially in AAU. So AAU is all about exposure. 
So I'm here to get exposed and, and make sure I get offers on the table. How are you keeping kids grounded and saying, listen, man, you got to earn this stuff. It's not going to be, it's not going to just be given to you because you got an EYBL tag and a Nike bag. I mean, I think for me, the biggest thing is honesty. And, you know, when I first started, it's like, hey, you got to, you know, I let them know what it's going to be. You know, and you got to make a decision on if you're willing to make those sacrifice sacrifices to, to be a part of it. You know, and it's not, honestly, man, it's not for everybody. And I don't, I don't knock no kid that don't want the structure or don't want that, hey, I, gotta, I got to, uh, you know, sacrifice my game from somebody for somebody else, you know, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. Like everybody got to figure out what their path is. But right. like I always tell people at the end of the day, these kids that's come through this program has been successful because the way that we do things and we're not going to change it. You know what I mean? I don't know how many more years I got at it, mm -hmm. but as long as I'm going, this is going to be the way it's going to be. And when I, even when I leave it to the next, the next group of guys that I leave it to, they're going to be held accountable to do the same things the way that we've been doing it over the last 10 plus years. So I remember I was down at Pete's Jam and you was on the sideline and I left there. I left there. Honestly, I say, yo, this is the black Bobby Knight. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, I said. Listen, man, I said, this dude is giving these refs an earful. You know what I'm saying? And then you had takeover was in back of you. Like, you know what I mean? So like, I can see the family atmosphere. So just tell me about like, you know, like how you feel like, you're viewed in the game and you know what I'm saying like you know how people see you and you know what I mean and you talked about not changing how you do things so you know do people you know has anybody ever come to you and say hey Keith man you, you gotta you gotta chill out man because of x y and z because sometimes it's we know it's political you know what I mean yeah. and, and people want you to to take the certain way and sometimes people you know sometimes guys I think kind of I don't want to say sell out but like mm -hmm. kind of like put who they are organically aside yeah. for you know what what they want to do so tell me how you how you balance that man it's it's um early on it was challenging you know what i mean because i've always coached with so much passion but over time you kind of got you have to realize that you know there is a certain stage and the kids are looking up to you you know so it's not to say that you can't you can't be fiery but you always at the same time you have to be you know, respectful on how you do it. And also you got to, you know, you got to, you just got to do it the right way. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So mm -hmm. for me, I think as I got older, I kind of realized, right. Like, hey, you're taking away, you're taking away the spotlight from the kids to an extent, you know, because mm -hmm. everybody become more focused on you and it's really not about me, you know, Absolutely. and it kind of over the last four years, like I've, I've really took that in, into consideration every time I walked on the court, but man, you just, it's one of those things, like, I'm not going to shoot bullshit. Like I hear all the, all the things that people say of, oh, you know, he's arrogant, you know, mm -hmm. he, you know, it's all about him, you know, and, and everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Like, right. but what I've never understood is, is, is a difference between arrogance and confidence. And then there's mm -hmm. a difference between arrogance and working. Like my job when I come in the gym is not to, you know, sit around and play with everybody. I'm working. Like I'm trying to get, I got a job that I'm trying to get done and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, rather it be when, I won't allow the kids to do interviews after a game and things like that. My thing is we're there to play basketball and to focus. And mm -hmm. sometimes the media attention can, can you know, that can be the, the problem in the locker room within itself, you know, because right. everybody wants that microphone or that ink pen in front of them, but mm -hmm. can everybody handle it and can the parents handle it? So right. the best way to keep everybody focused on that time is to kind of let's, let's focus pretty much on the game and let's just, and let's take care of business. And after that, then if you want to talk, you can talk, but, you know, Absolutely. doing those doing those games, man. We just got to be locked in, and at the end of the event, you know, we can we can kind of uh, socialize and do the things we need to do that you no want to do. Right? No doubt, no doubt. I got to shout out my boy Flight White. Just got up in there, man. One of my <laughs> listen, man. One of my favorites, man. My wife know that Flight White is one of my favorites. Shout out to you. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Hey, so, yo, man. Let me tell you about that dude. Like, we were <laughs> at, I'm coaching high school basketball. He was in the tenth grade, uh -huh. and man, we're in Akron, Ohio, and Playing in this event they used to call be called Ohio against the world. Mm -hmm. First time I ever ever seen a dude. I'm talking. He's 15 years old, and this janitor was athletic and wanted to have a dunk off with him. And I put a quarter, no exaggeration, one step behind the three point line. I mean, behind the free throw line. Mm -hmm. Man, he jumped. Never touched a quarter two hand dunk from the free throw line. Yeah, you know. But when I like one of the better players and one of the greatest people you can ever meet right there. 
That kid you know, was unbelievable. Nah, I love that dude, man. Love that dude, man. So AU, AU gets a, a bad rap sometimes. So there's a lot of up and down, you know what I mean? It's a lot of up and down in this game. So, but there's a there's probably like a misconception. Talk mm -hmm. to me about the, um, the skill development with Team Takeover because I'm assuming, you know, people say, oh, you know, you guys got, you know, there's elite players all through the EYBL circuit or whatever. So they don't even practice, man. They just come on these trips and they fly <laughs> kids from all over the place and they throw the balls out and say, yo, go do what you do. So tell me about that, about the misconception of that because I know there are some there are some teams who do do that, but they, I know that there's some programs out there that develop their players and it shows when the same ones are getting to that are playing right. like the, the last, you know, the last four, you know, last couple of games yeah. during Pete's jam. And man, you can you can look at it and tell. I mean, the same people consistently consistently have success. You know what I mean? And and that's because the work they're putting in. Mm -hmm. For us, we don't really we don't really recruit a lot of kids from out of town. Mm -hmm. You know, we might get a kid from Philly once in a blue moon or Richmond. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's it's a difficult task for those kids because. We run so much stuff, and we practice four or five days a week, and and that's and it's mandatory. It's not a thing where you can't you can't use excuses of, you know, not to say academics isn't is important isn't important, but you can't come to me and say I can't make practice because I got homework because part of part of teaching this is pe is teaching these kids how to manage their time. Right. You know, when you go play for Coach K, you can't tell him I got a science project I can't do this because you get a syllabus at the beginning of the year, you know that project is coming. Mm -hmm. And right. I always tell the parents and the kids, if that one hour is going to be the difference and you passing that test, you're probably not going to pass that test. Right. So for us, <laughs> we need people that can get in there and want to be committed to getting better. Right. You know, and we, we practice, you know, we, like I said, people always ask me, how do you get so many talented kids to mesh together? But a lot of it is because those kids believe in something that's being given and put in, put in front of them. And it's, yeah. and it's not easy to get them to buy into it. It's like I always say, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that you have to be, you have to, if you're in this area, you have to play for takeover to be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to figure out what's your niche because this is, this niche isn't for everyone, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, I want to see every kid come out of this area be successful. You mm -hmm. know, and I want to challenge every coach to be the best coach and developer that you can be to help make sure these kids get the opportunities they're trying to get. Okay. So what do you do? How do you handle what I call a culture killer? You know what I mean? So we about this and we're an established program. So when you come over here, you're supposed to already know what we about, but you got the kid that's there for self. And on top of that, the kid might not get no playing time. And now the parent is like, Keith, 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 why my kid, why my kid, da, da, da. How do you handle that? First of all, man, like, not to be an ass, like I don't deal with too much of the, the keep, 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 and I think everybody that knows me know that. And I think it's a lot of this, man. Like, you have to vet the talent before you bring it into your gym, you mm -hmm. know. So, you know, we have, as people say on the circuit, we travel with an entourage, but people don't understand mm -hmm. those guys. They get out there, and they're the reason we're successful because they work and they go in there, and we don't just go look at games. We look at the families, how they interact at the games, and and mm -hmm. things like that to figure out if it makes sense. It's rare that we bring somebody in that gym that doesn't make sense because by the time we didn't watch them over that six or eight month period, by the, by the time it gets to, hey, yeah, this kid is coming, we we kind of know what we're dealing with. And that mm -hmm. parent knows. You know, we kind of put it up front. Like, I'm a, I'm a type of person that if you're going to come play for me, I give you the worst case scenario. Like, mm -hmm. I want you to know what really can happen. You may play eight or ten minutes a game. Can you handle that? And if you say yes, then I should never hear your parents should never call me. Your parents should never want to talk to me after the game. You know, it should be, hey, this is what I this is what I signed up for. Let me figure out how to work my ass off to be to get more. And that's right. really what it boils down to. So we don't really we don't really have the turnover that a lot of other programs probably have because of that. Nice. That's why that's why I like I like to I like to hear stuff like that. So how do you handle the kids being recruited? You know what I'm saying? Like, um, I don't want to say, do you steer them in a direction, but are you realistic with them about the level? You know what I'm saying? Because everybody's, you know, I was, I was talking to some friends of mine when, you know, when we played, you know, there wasn't social media and stuff like that. We didn't know where kids were. We didn't know where kids were going. Um, you know what I'm saying? When we played, because it wasn't no social media. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kyle Kachowski was the only game in town, and yeah. you had to wait for the typewriter, you know, typewriter report. I remember being at um at St. Thomas More and playing against Johnny Rhodes. Right, right. And I didn't, you know, listen, 
I knew he was nice, but I didn't know who he was being recruited. I didn't know who his top five was. You know, I never heard him be blessed to get an offer. I just knew the kid was good. So, um, like, how do you handle the kids recruiting? Because I know a lot of kids will say, like, oh, this kid got an offer from such and such. You know, Keith, how come, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do you handle their recruiting? You know, I think for us, man, we kind of, like you said, it's honesty. You know what I mean? I always tell the kid, don't, it's not always about where you want to go as opposed to where, where you should go. Mm -hmm. You know, then the other thing is making sure you can go somewhere where, where you gonna have an opportunity because, you know, when you start talking about African, the majority of our kids, majority of these kids are African American, and, and always tell people like, "Hey, if a kid goes somewhere and they're not playing as a freshman or a sophomore, more than likely they're gonna suffer. They're gonna suffer in the classroom. Right? You know, you're away from home. You went somewhere to be on the basketball court. You're not on the basketball court. So then that's gonna start affect, affecting things off the court. So right. my thing is just be honest with them. You know, at the end of the day, like I always tell parents, like. My job is I'm your advisor. My job is to give you the pros and cons. My team job is to give you the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you got to sit down with your family and figure out what's the best decision. But when you walk into that decision-making process, you're going to have all the information that's needed to make a quality decision. And I think that's why we don't have – we've been fortunate not to have a lot of turnover as far as kids transferring and being in the transfer portal every year because our kids, not only do they go to the right schools – but if you look at it, the track record, they play when they get there because they pick the right schools. Right. And right now, I want to shine some light on. So right now, we're on here with Keith Stevens, president of Team Takeover. If you got any questions, please put them in the question box. I'm going to take the first five questions, and I'm going to ask them at the end. Um, but right now, I want to shine some light on something that I saw. So people know that you got some NBA players that came out, you know, the first thing they talk about is Victor Oladipo and everything like that. And I think that's great, but I want to shine some light on this 98% college graduation rate. I mean, that's important, man. But I think that that whole thing goes back to vetting the parents and the families that you bring into the program. And, and so many times, man, like, you know, people always say, well, you don't take enough public school kids. You don't take enough inner city kids. But the reality is, it's not, it's not that you don't want to take those kids, but it's, mm -hmm. do those kids want to, you know, conform to what they need to conform to, to, to be successful? Like, do they want to, mm -hmm. do they want to make the changes? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I'm, I'm all for kids, you know, and just mm -hmm. because you, whether you do or you don't play for me, doesn't mean that I'm not going to help you. You know what right. I mean? Like, yeah. There's a lot of kids that, you know, in this area when they played for other programs and when that time, when the time comes to make a decision, they might call and say, Hey coach, my son is looking at this. What do you know about this school? Or do you think this makes sense? Or can you make a phone call? Like, if it's really genuinely about the kids, like, that's really, really what it's about. Like, making sure these kids in our community get an opportunity. You know, and I can't, like, the reality is I can't coach every kid. You know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm real with that. And I can't right. have, and I can't have the 10 best kids. I can't have the 10 best kids in the area all on one team. Like, that's kind of hard because, Everybody got their own agendas. Everybody got things that they want to achieve. So everybody's not going to be in the space where they're ready to make a sacrifice to go and win nationally. Some people just want want different things to, to happen. Absolutely. So one question here is right now is, do you guys ever cut players? We do. We do. Okay. No, like I, and I think that's the hardest part, man, is because every year you got to come back and you got to reevaluate because I always tell parents when, when you get to eighth grade basketball, mm -hmm. it's kind of you, you become you, you become entrenched into the business of basketball at that point because now you're talking about programs getting, getting monetary funding, you know what I mean, and things like that. So in order to continue to get that funding, you got to be good. Right. You know, but I think one of the – somebody you don't hear just asked me, like, when, and why do you cut? Yeah, a kid. A kid usually gets cut because that kid didn't get better, right? Because when you really think about it, as from an AU standpoint, and as far as the older kids, we probably got we probably have a kid from April, the end of March to July. So, so the reality is during that time, that's a short period of time. You're getting ready for games. You're putting some time in the gym, but they still got high school summer league. They got high school workouts. So you're trying to mix all that together. My thing is, from ju the end of July until that following year, what are you going to do to get better? Right. You know, are you going to reach out to your AU coach, high school coach, or whoever? 
So no kid is just getting cut to be cut. If you're not making a team, you know, you're not making a team because you're not performing or you're not on the level you need to be on. That's no different than when you go into the work world or anything. Like, the reality is every day, everybody that's on here listening or talking, we got to perform in order to keep out to keep our space in which we are. And if you don't perform, they're going to replace you. So that's right. kind of how that works. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the NCAA came in and they changed, they changed stuff around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the recruiting calendar. So how do you feel? How did you feel about that initially? Like, you know, do you feel like disrespected? Like, you know what I mean? Cause I felt like, okay, they trying to put, they trying to put it, you know, they trying to put the control back into the high schools cause they don't like what's going on in AAU and, you know, maybe the type of person that they would like to see kind of, behind, you know what I mean? Like maybe, you know, you can call it controlling things. They don't like, you know, they don't like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, what are your thoughts on how the NCAA came in and, and everything like that? And also talk about your relationships with high school coaches because I think there's a thing out there that AAU coaches don't get along with high school coaches. And part of it is partly true. You know what I'm saying? So sure. talk about that. Which one you want to start with first? Let's start with the NCAA changing the rules first. Let's go to that first. So, man, it's like, so with the NCAA thing, like, for us, man, it's like, it, it all depends on the program and, 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 and where you are and how it affects you. Mm -hmm. For me, for me, like, it's going to sound crazy. It's like it was, it, it allowed me to have more time with my family. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, you know, the reality is if you are in this program at 16, 15, 16, and 17, more than likely you're on the right path to being recruited. And there's a such thing as being overworked. You know, like I'm I'm not big on overworking kids to the point to where, you know, it can, they can have injury and stuff like that. So for us, we probably play on average 25 games in the spring and summer. Right. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so for me, like it doesn't affect me as much as other programs. So I can't really speak into it. I just, I wish that, that my only issue is I think it'll, it takes away from a kid that may not play for a takeover or may not play for a New York Rams or team final or open soldiers. It takes away from their opportunity to be successful. You know what I mean? Like if you plan for be it, we are one, be it, be it one of these major shoe company programs, you're going to get seen regardless. But right. what if you plan on a hoop group circuit or a non shoe affiliated circuit, you get put in a bad situation where those kids don't get the same opportunities because those coaches, a lot of the coaches that need to see them, they don't have the resources from a program standpoint to travel mm -hmm. around and see them like need be. Mm -hmm. So now talk about how do you feel about, do you think that they did this to put the power back in high school? Yeah, I to think take, they did. You know, to, I, take I the power, to take I, the power I, away from the Keith Stevens of the world. Like we don't want him, we don't want him having any type of pull in this game. So the only thing is like they probably I'm probably not the person they worried about <laughs> because I, I actually man like a lot of that stuff I talk to them about, you know, mm -hmm. and I and I you know when they when they're making those decisions, I'm I'm fortunate to be, you know, either a phone call or, you know, on a on a conference call with them to talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. as you can see, I don't know how much my word really matters when I'm in because <laughs> they're still doing this shit anyway. But right. But I, but at least I get to have somewhat of a voice. But I think it's definitely that but I think my issue with them is like, at the end of the day, be it high school or be it AU, like at the end of the day, just because you have a degree doesn't mean that you're not crooked. Right. You know what I mean? That's yeah. because just because there's a principal looking over you as opposed mm -hmm. to a board of directors looking over you doesn't mean you're not crooked. You know what I mean? I right. think they're stereotyped because it's summer basketball and it's not affiliated with a school and they're saying, mm -hmm. oh, those guys must have an agenda. When the reality is, who's to say that agenda isn't the same as the high school coaches was to make sure that these kids get the, to get to get a free education, you know? And right. I think that's where they're kind of missing. Right. They're missing the boat at, and like that would be my biggest gripe with it. It's like, hey, let's figure out what really makes sense because they're not looking at it from a basketball standpoint. They're only looking at it from their standpoint and as a business, right? So when when you really when you really think about this. When you when you really think about this, most most people are, you know, they're just they're just trying to they're just trying to get an opportunity, right? You know, they're just trying to really get an opportunity. So you just gotta man, you just gotta uh, accept the rules that they put in. 
you know, you just encourage your kids to um to work. But no, what I was gonna say is what they don't understand, I'm sorry, but I lost my train of thought. I was reading a text at the bottom. What they what they what they what they, what they miss out is whether it's me, the high school coach or whoever, there's a certain thing of a kid hearing a voice too much. Mm -hmm. Right? So you're asking yeah. the kid to be with his high school coach from September to the end of their season at the beginning of March or the middle of March, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're telling them, I need you to still be practicing with them because we're going to have these other events with them. At some point, mm -hmm. just know the performance of that kid can be affected because him and the high school coach relationships becomes tarnished because that high school coach or the AU coach, whoever it may be, it could be toxic because of the way they're coaching them. So, right. And it doesn't give the kids an opportunity. Like, my biggest thing has always been, like, I don't allow coaches – to move up with their with their players. Like, so you got a different coach every year. And the reason right. I do that is because I feel like kids need to learn how to adapt to different personalities, right? So right. if you're just playing for one high school coach and he's not a yeller, what happens mm -hmm. when you go play for that coach that is a yeller in college? You know what happens? You end up transferring because you only know one way. Right. You know what I mean? And so, but they don't understand basketball. Right. So they're not looking at all those old, all those things when, they, when they're thinking about this. Absolutely. So I appreciate all the questions, but I'm going to lock all the questions out right now. Only get an hour on this um, on this IG feed. We want to make sure that we don't hey, get look. cut off like we did hey, last look. time. Man. You just bring it back. I ain't going nowhere. I'm good. <laughs> all right, cool. All right. So um, another question um, somebody wanted to know. The four EYBL programs that you respect <laughs> besides yours. So that'll be like a top five. You, not, not answering that question. You're not going to answer that? Hey, listen, man, no, no. no. Man, no, no, that, that's no. a good answer. <laughs> but no, 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 real talk, real talk. So mm -hmm. I always tell people, man, like, mm -hmm. if you for kids, I'm for you. Yeah. Like, that's really what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm, you know, everybody has their years. Like, you know, yeah. there's, there's a couple of us that's consistently good every year. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if, you, if you're doing what's right for the kids, like, I'm all for you. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Now, Absolutely. Now, there's now, there's a difference things between respecting programs and respecting coaches. Now, there's coaches that I can see and say, I respect what they do, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or there's program directors that I respect what they may do from a business standpoint or whatever it may be. But from a, overall, yeah. my thing is like, man, if you're for the kids, I'm for you. I'm all in. Nice, nice. So this kind of goes along. I'm going to mesh two questions together. So with this pandemic that we got going on right now, mm -hmm. How do you feel like this is going to affect recruiting and the AAU programs and AAU, you know, um, tournaments and events, you know, in the near future? And what is Team Takeover doing, you know, to abide by that? Because, like I said, y'all travel deep. What's hey, going I know, I know, I know, I know we ain't doing. Deep, so hey, look, this social distancing thing, like, I know, what, what, I, I know we ain't doing right that? now. No, <laughs> what we ain't doing is we ain't seeing each other right now. I can tell you that. But no, nah, man, I think it's um. It's going to be interesting, you know what I mean? Like, if you, you know, what, I, what I've tried not to do as much, man, is get caught up in in the news as much as possible because everybody got their opinion be it the, with the media. Like, you know, people saying we need to be back at, we need to open back up the floodgates in the next month. People saying we shouldn't do anything. You know, you kind of got to, you just got to kind of wait and see. Man. Right. And, and, and hopefully that you have an infrastructure, you have an infrastructure in place to whatever it is, you can adapt to it. You know what I mean? Like, if they say, hey, we're not going to have games this year, then, hey, then we need to get on the phone and we need to be constantly putting putting info out on kids and getting video out to them to make sure they still get recruited. And if they say we are playing, then we need to make sure that we're doing the right things to protect these kids and these families when we get on the road. So just the biggest thing is just having the infrastructure in place to be able to adapt to whatever comes down, down the road because nobody really knows. Right. Absolutely. Uh, let me shout out my man, Bino Ranson, assistant coach at the University of Maryland, old teammate of mine, and my boy, A-Game Podcast, man. Thank you for coming on and seeing what we do. Somebody I watch very, very closely. I appreciate it. We on here with Keith Stevens, president of Team Takeover. So let's talk about the transfer portal. <laughs> let's talk about the transfer portal. Do you feel like the transfer portal is – because kids are choosing the wrong school because you kind of went on it. Like, what if you don't play for a yeller and then mm -hmm. you go to school and then you play for a yeller? Now you in the transfer portal. Do you or do you feel like 
kids are going to school already knowing that they want to leave. Like, you know what I'm saying? Or like, what's your feelings on that? Because, you know, right now, especially what's going on right now, I think if you are unsigned 2020 right now. It could get tricky. But between grad transfers and the damn transfer portal, <laughs> It's it's dark out there for you right now, man. Hey, man. So with the transfer portal, like I said, man, we've we've been blessed to not have a lot of kids transfer, and I think a lot of that is because the family. So you know, like it, it really starts at home, man. Like you know, mm -hmm. I, I was watch. I looked at something the other day, and they were talking about kids that switch high schools and AAU teams and how they usually transition to when mm -hmm. they get to when they get to college, and yeah. and that was a real statement. Like you know, I'm not a big social media guy. Like people was texting me like, I can't believe you're doing a IG thing, but <laughs> and I know, appreciate but, that. You know, but my thing is like that was one thing I did see on social media that that that's that's really real. You know what I mean? Like you gotta ask yourself, are these kids going to the right situations? Are they getting the right advice? You know, and and are these coaches really telling them what they need to hear as opposed to what they want to hear? Right? Mm -hmm. But then you also gotta ask yourself, is the parents vicariously trying to live through their kids? You know what I mean? Because all those things are are the realities. Um, I think for, for me, man, it's just like, it just, it just becomes a consistent, a consistence of instability, you know, for a kid to just constantly transfer and run from a situation. Like at some point in life, you got to learn to fight through things. Right. Mm -hmm. And to see the discouraging thing is when you see kids transfer after their freshman year, like you haven't even seen what's, what's there for you. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And and what what it also tells you is you didn't do your research mm -hmm. before you committed or signed with that university. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that's that's a uh that's kind of um disheartening, you know, to know that mm -hmm. a lot of these kids really, man, like people are people at a, at our age are becoming fans of these kids as opposed as opposed to mentors or parents and things like that and coaches. Mm -hmm. You know, we become the fans of them and it's like Oh man, it's cool. You want to go here, or you got this list? I won't say the kid name. I, I looked at a kid the other day, and he put his top ten schools out, and he's transferring from a, a high major university. And I'm like, you're transferring from a high major university where you're playing at, and then you're trying. But then the top ten schools you get was all top twenty five schools in the country. Like, what's so? What is it? Like, what? What's your purpose, and what's your reasoning for really transferring? Right. You know, and then you you get kids that say. Look, I went to Gonzaga, or I went to, I went to Maryland, and I averaged four points a game. But then you go transfer to Duke or Michigan. Like that doesn't make sense. If you wasn't that good at Maryland, you're probably not gonna be that good at Duke or Michigan. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But you get, but these kids still, and these kids and these parents, they still get caught up in the name of the institutions. Yes. As as opposed to, you know, the, the situations. You know what I mean? Because it's not yes. about it's not where you as much as about what you wanted as much as it is what you need it because if they need you right. if they need you the ones are going to fall in line with the needs you know what i mean right. but absolutely i just think a lot of people just they get they're misguided they really right. misguided in the transfer portal is if, if this thing could be real tricky man like if they if they pass this rule in the next couple of weeks where where you can just transfer and not sit out that that right there becomes a, a whole nother dynamic because it's, it's one of those things, man, if you think about it, like we probably have 700 some kids in the transport, transfer portal right now, right? You're going to get, I can assure you, if they pass this rule, you're going to get an additional 300 because a lot of kids might want to transfer right now, but they don't want to sit out that year. Just imagine yeah. them saying you don't have to sit out. That dude that's this grown up, that's the ninth man right now, oh, he's gone. Right. Because now there's no consequences, you know what I mean. And, mm -hmm. and more and more in this in the, in this basketball, they're they're allowing it to be no consequences for these kids, right? You know what I mean. And at yeah. some point, the guys that that believe in doing things the way that we were brought up in doing it, mm -hmm. you're gonna watch and see these guys start to fade out of this game because this game now, man, is becoming all about like somebody just says it becomes more about the attention than the product productivity and the work. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, I've said it, you know, before, you had some players yeah. over the years come through your program. But in all these years and on this circuit, 
I'm sure there's somebody that was on the other side of the ball that gave you a fit on the sideline where you had to tear into these dudes like, yo, what the hell are y'all doing? Who was that one player that was getting at y'all? And then as the coach, what's the adjustment that y'all made? Could an adjustment be made? Well, I'll tell you one of them. It wasn't, it wasn't no adjustment made. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that was that was Archie Goodman. Um, he played Ooh. at Kentucky. Yes. You know, yes. you know, and shit. And he did it with a sprained wrist with his rent with his hand wrapped up. Um, you know, and then then the other one was <laughs> was Harry Giles. I mean, it was just one of those things where we knew every play they were gonna run. Like we mm -hmm. were prepared, but shit, being prepared and then still scoring was like like that's the hardest thing is just know that you're ready for what's coming at you, but you can't stop it. I was right. those are the those were the two most difficult because and and when you kind of the, the crazy thing is like the the thing on the EYBL circuit, the thing on the EYBL circuit is oh shit, if if I we want to see how good a kid is when they play in this takeover because if nothing else, they know we're gonna we're gonna defend and we're gonna get after it and and we're gonna be disciplined and, and, and what our philosophies are and things like that. And mm -hmm. and and what happens is, you know, you kinda that's kind of where you can make your mark if you can if you can really get off right there. But now I mean right. those are like like we've lost games, don't get me wrong, but it's been more mm -hmm. so I don't think too many players, one individual has really dominated us out, outside of those two. And even mm -hmm. with with Harry, he was as good as he was. You know, Al Tariq was really good. Uh the kid that got drafted by the Minnesota Timberwolves was really good. The kid for the Boston Celtics, uh, Grant Williams, was really good. You know, so he had some help. But those were the guys I felt like we really had a problem just really, like, honing down on that one person and, and being able to get them out the game. Right. Absolutely. How do you feel about reclassification? Hey, listen, man, like, <laughs> to each his own. For me, to each his own. But here's, here's one thing I'll, I'll give. I'll give to – I've always tell parents when they ask me about it. So I'm going to run down a couple of kids in the last few years that played with us. Victor Oladipo, Eric Green, Josh Hart, um, Jeremy Grant, Jeremy Grant. Uh, shit. Um, Jalen Smith from Maryland. Uh, shit, I'm missing guys. We've only had one kid that got drafted in the NBA. That was a reclass. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I, I think with at some point, here, here's what people don't understand is like, at some point it catches up, right? But then mm -hmm. here's the other thing with it is when, so let's say you're a really good player as a freshman, right? If I'm 19 as a senior and I'm a really, really good senior, right? I'm almost operating on the one or two year window when I go to college. I don't mm -hmm. have, I can't, I don't have a lot, the luxury of playing for four years like Josh Hart did and still going the first round. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. the way the NBA works, your age is just as important as your game. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. they, just like they evaluate your game, they evaluate your age. And, and what ended up happening is, after a certain age, they started to say things like, oh, his ceiling, he's he's tapped out or he doesn't have a high ceiling and things like that. So when when you reclass, like, you got to – none of you ever notice, you see a lot of kids reclass and then they reclass up, back up, because mm -hmm. they need that advantage. Like, because if you're 23, you can't tell me how many kids – I think every year it might be one kid that's over 21 years old to get drafted in the first round. Okay. Right. You know, so eventually you're going to get penalized for that reclass if you're if that's your ultimate goal. Now, I never I never look down on a person that says, hey, I just don't think my son is ready to go into that social environment with 17, 18, 19 year old kids at a high school level. You know, I just don't think he can really deal with that. He's not mature enough. I get it. I never right. knock a kid that's saying, hey, my son will really struggle, you know, in math or science or economics, whatever that's, that class may be, I think he needs another year to work on it. You know, what, what my issue become is when you start telling me, oh, I'm going to reclass him because I, I just think, like, he, gonna, he got a growth spurt coming. 
Right. He just saying he's not mature enough, not as a person, but he's not mature enough in his body yet. Like that's the bullshit. Like at the end of right. the day, what that says to me is you're living through your kid. Right. Absolutely. Because if your kid is good, he's gonna get a scholarship anyway. Right. Absolutely. You know, that's kind of where I'm with it. So somebody talked about playing against the Compton Magic a few years back with your with your Pete's Jam team. Um, they want to know how it happened and who reached out to you first. So uh, <laughs> that's a uh, that's a touchy one. <laughs> I, I, I caught a uh, I caught a I caught a lot I caught a lot from playing that game. But uh, like at the end of the day, like. No disrespect to nobody. I, I did the game because my kids wanted to play the game, you know, and, mm -hmm. I, and I can't be a I can't be a hypocrite if I tell my kids in order to be the best, we got to play the best and not play that game. Right. You know what I mean? And, and I, you know, and I respect Compton Magic to the fullest. It was it was it was a lot of people that reached out. More importantly, it was more so my relationship with Gary Charles that got that game done more than anything. And right. what, what, what is crazy about that is he and I agreed on that game probably in early May or, or late April before any of the things transpired with us two becoming the best two teams that year. So that game was, that game was agreed upon um, way beforehand. You know what I mean? So it was, I mean, like, I don't, I don't regret it. You know what I mean? I don't regret it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't make no excuses about it. Like everybody knows what happened. They, they won the game. And, you know, like I said, I, I respect that program to the fullest. Now you think you caught more flat because you lost to an Adidas program and you were the winning Nike program, or I mean, because I, 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 I mean, because I, I think I think yeah. it was more so. Be honest, what, what do we? We were number one in the country. Like, what do we have to lose? I mean, what what do we had? What do we gain? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I had like I walked into that gym with nothing to gain on the West Coast, playing at two o'clock in the morning. You know, if we win. We supposed mm -hmm. to win. If we lose, oh, you lost. Like we had, right, game. right. You know, it was more so my kids being who they are, and uh, just you know, my kids being who they are, and one and one to play some guys that was really goddamn good. Right. So, you know, with a high with a high level team like you, like your like team takeover, you said earlier you don't necessarily take every high level kid in the DMV area. Why is that? Like, do you do that for the culture? Like, because I think there's a piece of, like, there has to be some meshing involved, right? So, like you said, I think if you take the top 10 kids in the DMV area, we're going to have some, we're going to have some clash, some ego clashes or whatever. So, do you think sometimes, listen, I need that, like, I got this top kid, but then I need that kid who's going to do everything. You know what I mean? I mean, I think, man, I think the whole thing is, like, you know, you got to ask yourself, Am I putting together a team to win or am I putting up putting together a team of talent? Because those mm -hmm. two those two different things. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm if I if I'm putting together a team to win, I gotta I gotta put together people that I know are gonna accept their roles. Right. You know, and gonna be be willing to play those roles night in and night out. If I'm mm -hmm. putting together a team of talent, now I become now I become a social worker because I'm trying to manage everybody's egos and their parents' egos and things like that, because there's an expectation. When you go from an average of 25 at a high school team and then you come to an AU team, you know, and you got to be willing to say, you know what, I can coexist with seven other guys that was the best player on their team. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't do that. You know what I mean? Right. And, mm -hmm. and once again, it goes back to how wild kids are successful in college mm -hmm. is because they can coexist with other good players. You know, on that, on that team that won it two years ago, I think them kids went to two went to North Carolina, one went to Duke, one went to UVA, one went to Villanova. Um, you know, kids went to Towson, Yale. Two kids went to Brown, one went to Charlotte. So when you when you put a team together, you had two go to University of Michigan. That's a lot, right? right. That's a lot. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they had a common goal, and they, their goal was to win. Right. You know what I mean? And, and when I asked them, even like when we bought. Armando Baycott back, I was like, hey, if we bring him back, it's going to affect some guys' minutes. So before I do this, I need to know how y'all feel about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and all 10 of those kids, those 11 kids sit there and looked in my eyes. They was like, look, 
he can help us win. We want him back. He's a part of what we started in the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So it has to be, it can't just be about what I want as a coach. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It got to also be about what they, who they're comfortable playing with in order for me to be able to make it all work and come together. 100. I feel you that. So I got to ask you this question. Hold up. Somebody just asked it. Er, my man AB just asked a question. I need to answer that one. Okay. His, his question was, what is your rule about guys playing up? Um, Man, here's my philosophy. If you're not, if if you're not starting or playing starter minutes, you don't need to play up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just don't think I don't think it benefits you or your just to be able to put on your resume. I played up and I sat on the bench where I was. A, I played eight minutes a game. You play up when you can be when you can be, you know, majorly effective, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. and when you and when you're ready to play up because there's a situation and an opportunity for you. Like for us, it's like we had a situation this year and we're trying to figure out, we were trying to figure out like, are we going to play this one kid up or not? And and like I told his dad, there's a couple of things I have to look at. I got a one. I have to see, I have to see who's on that team ahead, be it 16 or 17 U team. Um, you, I got to see who's on that team. And if there's a need for him to play up because we don't mm -hmm. have what we need, I will play him up because I know he's going to play. But I'm not going to play a kid up just because mom and dad want him to play up or the high school coach or the trainer want him to play up to keep him in a program if there's not mm -hmm. a, a real opportunity for him to get on the court. I just don't believe in that. Right. No, I definitely understand that. I definitely understand that. So, But, but it goes back – but it kind of goes back to what I said earlier, like, when we start talking about the pros, mm -hmm. Victor didn't play up. Right. Jeremy didn't play up. Jerrion didn't play up. You know, mm -hmm. Josh didn't play up. The guys that's making the real money now, they didn't play up. Right. You know, they played their age groups and and they and they grinded out and they developed and they and they worked to you know to continue to you know develop their craft. Nah, I definitely, I definitely understand that. I definitely understand that. So, the best high school player you've seen with your own two eyes ever. I don't care if it's on the circuit. I don't care where it was. The best ever that you've seen. I've seen or coach. Seen? We're going to start with seen first. Seen LeBron. LeBron. Okay. I've seen LeBron. That same event that we was at where I talked about what James White did. Mm -hmm. I watched LeBron play against O'Kill as a sophomore 15 mm -hmm. years old and had 41 points in that game. Right. Yeah, LeBron was LeBron was real. Best high school player you've ever coached? Demar Johnson. <sighs> yeah, a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't remember DJ. Like DJ that was, was the truth. Like that was. Like when you start talking about talent, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. You talking about a kid that at six nine could put the ball on the floor, shoot it from anywhere, athletic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know. Like it wasn't, you know, only only hole in this game, if anything, was his at that point was his strength. Mm -hmm. But he still was wiry, strong on offense to be able to just get shit done, you know, night in and right. night out. Right. One of the first ones they talk about going straight to the league, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Nah, DJ was DJ was the truth. DJ was definitely the truth, man. Um I gotta ask this question. I asked Kamani Young the other night this question. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Charlie, Charlie, you know who Charlie Bell is? From Michigan State, Charlie no, Bell? No, the real Charlie Bell, KD's, KD's right-hand guy. No, nah, I don't know him. So Charlie Bell played for me. He said he thought I was going to say him. <laughs> hey, Charlie, you definitely, he definitely one of the best shooters. He played at Loyola, Maryland. Okay. Um, you know, and, I mean, he's carved his own niche. Like, you know, he's vice president of vice, at Rock Nation and things like that. Okay. Good dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I asked Kamani, you know, who we thought was the top five players to come out of New York City. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, top five to come out of DMV, in your opinion. And you got to rank them. Yeah, man, you you should have gave me that earlier if I could. No, no, no. We got to put this on the spot. This is that lightning. Let's go. Let's get it. Now, you got to go earth. Like, you can't, you can't just say... We got 
you gotta if you ask me from two thousand to now, that's much mm -hmm. easier because if we start going back, you start talking about, you know, Kurt Smith and Dave yeah. Ving and all them dudes, yeah. like that, that's a that's a different so make it easy different make thousand. it easy for yourself. Give me two thousand right now. Make it easy on yourself. I'ma go <laughs> You talking about a high school, right? High school, high school. No, yeah, yeah, high school players, you know what I mean? And however you want to group them in, what no, they no, did later you on. Got, you got you gotta be more, you gotta be more specific. You want me to be specific? Because, right, so give me... because if we if we talk in high schools, like some of those high school guys didn't make make it to the, the pros. If we're, right. if we're if we're talking about guys overall and what their success was, that's mm -hmm. a whole different list. So all right, so then you're gonna give me both lists then because we got time. All right, so I'm gonna give you high school first. Give me high school first, then give me the lead. Give, then give me the overall. I'm gonna go high school from the two thousands up. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Demar Johnson. Mm -hmm. Man, I gotta call. I gotta call Instagram, man, and I got. I need unlimited time, man. I gotta tell them I need unlimited time, man. Jeez, Instagram gotta give me more time for real. Keith about to hop back on here. Jesus. Hey, <laughs> so we go back to the high school. We said Demar Johnson, Kevin Durant. Is that as far as we got? That, yeah. Okay. Then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Ty Lawson. Ty Lawson. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna go. Ah man, let me think on this. Oh shit, Mike Beasley. I was just, I was gonna, I, I was gonna say Mike Beasley, and I'm gonna go with my fifth spot. I'm gonna go Mike Sweetney. Mike Sweetney. Somebody just said that Mike Sweetney, huh? Yeah, that definitely helped me. I was about to go, I was about to go Joe Forte. Then I seen that Mike Sweetney name pop up. Interesting. It's a lot. It's a lot. All right. So now, give me overall. Overall. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go. Some good. Steve Francis can't be. He was 98. So I'm gonna go. Kevin. Kevin Durant was one. I'm gonna go. Victor Oladipo two. I'm gonna go. Ty Lawson three. If he don't. If we don't leave Denver, he's definitely that. I'm gonna go with let me think on this. Three. I'm biased on my next pick. I'm gonna go Jeremy Grant four. Okay. Okay. And I'm gonna go Mike B. I'm gonna ah, I'm gonna go Michael Jeffrey. Shit. <laughs> Damn. That's tough. I'm going to go with Jeff Green because his longevity. Jeff Green. Yeah. Now, now Mello was Mello was 2000, right? That's Baltimore. That's Baltimore. Okay. That's not DMV? That's Baltimore. Okay. Okay. If we go, if we go, if we go, if we put them in there, I got to shake it up a little bit. Yeah, you got to shake it up. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now you got Mello, you got Rudy Gay, we got to shake it up. But I'm going to leave it. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it DC. The, yeah, I'm gonna leave it on the south side. Okay. All right. No problem. No problem. I gotta go get me. I gotta go get somebody from Baltimore to come on there. I gotta go find somebody oh, in Baltimore to talk got, about got, Baltimore. Hey, hey, they got a nice list now. Yeah. Nah. Shoot. I believe it. I definitely believe it. I definitely believe it, man. For real. For real. So listen, man. Again, man. This was an honor, man. And I appreciate kicking it with you, man. 
looking forward to meeting you at some point out here in these on one of these courts or one of these venues one day, man. And you know, you you were 